The amount of investment Japan has made into the UK over the last two decades has been phenomenal. Essentially, the base for many companies such as Nissan and others in Europe. How much of that is all in danger should a Brexit take place? Well, that all depends on what happens after Brexit and what are the arrangements that uh, UK and EU will agree on continuing the economic relations uh, over Dover. So uh, this, uh, in one word, is uncertainty. And has that uncertainty, just looking back as well over these last, I would say, four years since the initial referendum, has that uncertainty put off any investments, capital expenditure of Japanese companies that would have otherwise been already in the UK uh, because of all what's happened, because of everything that's happened? Um, I think there are two uh, uh, perspectives here that need to be taken into account. One is mm. the uh, lack of uh, clear uh, direction of uh, where things will go or, uh, in the immediate future because, uh, uh, for example, manufacturing industry it requires to have uh, a market assessment if they are to expand their production level now. Uh, and therefore, unless they are assured that the market will be stronger and wider, uh, it is not wise to uh, expand their production capacity. Uh, on the other hand, there are other uh, industries, uh, high-tech, uh, financial services, uh, all the intellectually very uh, added value industries that don't necessarily have to depend on a limited market access because their market is by definition more global so uh, the effect of uh, uncertainty differs from industry to industry and those that are being mostly affected are the ones that are exporting their products across border and ambassador do you expect this election to provide any type of clarity or do you need to see a little bit more <coughs> in terms of the EU and UK trade relationship before you see that rise in investment back into the UK? The uh, result of the election is not going to be immediately providing uh, anyone with uh, uh, foresight into what may happen in the immediate future because uh, the relationship between UK and EU will depend on the content and the result of negotiation to create uh, the future arrangement, uh, which has not even happened. So uh, this is going to be a long process if indeed uh, the withdrawal agreement is being approved by the uh, Parliament, Westminster, and uh, take effect, then uh, the negotiation between UK and EU for future arrangements may start. Uh, but until such time as uh, we have all the details of what has been agreed between UK and EU for the future arrangement, again, uh, there will be lots of questions asked and no answers provided, which again will continue to be a part of uncertainty. So it's a start of a long process uh, at a minimum, and that process uh, depends on the result of the, the election that will come in a few hours. And as someone who also helped oversee negotiations, do you see a UK-EU trade agreement, assuming, of course, we get a starting point after what happens today, do you see an agreement by the end of next year, or is that wishful thinking? Uh, of course, uh, no one would uh, uh, say uh, impossible because uh, if uh, there is possibility, uh, I mean, if people are trying to uh, uh, put things in place, uh, anything can be done. But uh, realistically speaking, and because of the physical constraint of uh, uh, agreeing on a number of issues that is so expansive and comprehensive, uh, and it's not just economy, but also political and other arrangements between two nations, uh, these are going to be a very, very uh, difficult negotiation, uh, both uh, physically and both intellectually. And when you think of uh, the stakeholders that are involved, uh, not just on the EU side, but even in the UK side, uh, you could consider how much time it requires for any position to be finalized. 
So it's a bit ambitious uh, to expect that you could conclude it within a few months. Ambassador, I want to just move away from what could happen with the British election and, and have a look at WTO and put your trade negotiator a hat on, as you will. With the ongoing dispute between Beijing and Washington and uh, the WTO in some senses on the sidelines, what's left of this organization and what is left of the trade order and the regulatory framework which surrounds it? Well, WTO has been established to be the global and universal platform for promoting global growth through trade, investment and protection of uh, uh, relevant rights including intellectual property. Uh, unfortunately, because of uh, the difficulties uh, of uh, uh, the countries uh, coming from different uh, uh, stages of economic development, uh, WTO negotiation, the Doha round, has not been able to produce results so far. Uh, therefore, uh, it was uh, in a way inevitable that uh, countries uh, that are depending very much on trade chose to go to a more selective partnership uh, such as uh, the uh, bilateral FTAs or even uh, TPP which Japan uh, had uh, also promoted. Uh, therefore, all these were supposed to be uh, the driving engine to go back to WTO uh, with more high quality uh, trade uh, arrangements including the uh, alignment of regulatory regimes that have been uh, agreed among uh, the major trading partners. Unfortunately, that has not happened, and uh, uh, this is going to be a very serious problem uh, because this means that uh, those that are not part of the selected uh, agreements are going to be left behind. And we cannot leave any country behind because the globe is one. And if you leave countries behind, they will fight back later. And we are planting seeds of conflicts by being just selective. And Ambassador, you mentioned about the TPP, and as, as the former chief negotiator for this, this body, I'm just wondering, what, what are the prospects now of the UK joining the CPTPP, and maybe your, what your outlook is for Japan and the UK to sign some sort of FTA? Uh, UK has already uh, concluded the uh, public uh, uh, consultation process uh, for uh, TPP 11, the CPTPP, and uh, uh, when uh, UK exits uh, EU, legally speaking, they will be capable of uh, engaging with the TPP 11 uh, to have uh, UK uh, come into TPP. Uh, that certainly is a possibility. And uh, in terms of the regulatory arrangements or uh, a number of uh, uh, regimes uh, on economic activities, UK and uh, TPP regimes are compatible with each other and I don't find uh, any serious difficulty for agreeing on a number of these measures. Uh, the tariffs and trade issues uh, again are not uh, of any serious difficulty and therefore uh, I do not see any a serious problem that may affect uh, UK coming into CPTPP uh, at uh, uh, some point in the future. It all depends however on whether UK will be able to come to that uh, decision when the arrangements between UK and EU has not been finalized because all these uh, arrangements do interlink with each other and you cannot just take one and then impose that one to the other. It has to be uh, interlinked, it has to be uh, uh, compatible with each other and you just don't know it unless you have one set of uh, arrangements uh, finalized how you could coordinate that with the other. Uh, the TPP arrangement is already finalized and it is up to UK sure. to agree on that, but uh, they may run the danger of agreeing to one position that uh, TPP holds, which may not be compatible with what uh, EU wants UK to do. So it's a bit of a complication here, 
Uh, but yeah. uh, overall, Japan would very much welcome uh, UK coming to CPTPP. Uh, we would uh, very much uh, very uh, welcome because of the benefit that UK can bring to this uh, big uh, uh, economic pact. Uh, the bilateral Japan-UK uh, economic partnership or uh, sure. free trade agreement, uh, there are always uh, a possibility that we can uh, agree on that. And uh, the second one, the two countries deal is easier than uh, multilateral ones.